Amen. Well, good morning. It is great to see everyone today. We've gonna, we're going to start just a little bit different this morning. Um, and uh, we're going to start with a little bit of a video. Uh, I hope that you'll kind of enjoy it. For those of you that remember the original movie or, or maybe a replay of the original movie, it ought to be kind of fun. For those of you that have never seen it, um, it is a good testament of your youth. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and try that. <laughs> The next song I'm about to sing is from the Broadway musical Annie Get Your Gun. Madeline, we're singing this song together. No, so, I'm singing this next song for Madeline. It's a duet. We're singing it together. No, Blair, listen. I'm singing this next song from the Broadway musical Annie Get Your Gun, and you are simply helping me. <laughs> okay, Shrimpy. I bet I can sing it better than you. No, you can't. We'll just see about that. Anything you do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Anything you can do, I can do greater sooner or later. I'm greater than you. No, you're not. I am. No, you're not. Yes, I but you're not as I am as I am. I'm here to partridge with a single cartridge. I can catch a sparrow with a bow and arrow. I can live on bread and cheese. And only on that, yes, so can a rat. Eddie, don't you say I'm so higher? I can see any note higher than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. I can. No, you can't. No, Cheaper. I can buy anything cheaper than you. 50 cents, 40 cents, 30 cents, 20 cents. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Anything you say, I'm consistent. I can say anything something. No, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. I can eat my sticker faster than liquor. I can eat it quicker and get even sicker. I can open any safe. Sure, that's what I thought you could. And you know, you can hold, I can hold a longer. I can hold that, you know, longer than you. No, you can't, yes, I can. No, you can't, yes, I can. No, you can't, yes, I can. No, yes, I Isn't that cute? I really liked it. I, uh, I found the original actually and uh, really enjoyed it, but it's such an old video that it was a little bit hard to see it. I found this one and I thought it was kind of fun and it tied in a little bit with what we were talking about this morning. How many of you have a relationship that is a little bit like this? None of you. You all get along with everyone. That's great. Uh, I've been to some of your Sunday school classes, and I know it's not true. Uh, but, uh, but that's okay. You can live in your delusional grandeur. Um, it, it's all good. You know what? Um, it is sometimes kind of fun. It, it's a little bit fun to be able to tease. It's a little bit fun uh, to be able to go back and forth. It's a little bit fun to debate sometimes. In my first ministry, there was a little diner in El Frida, and, and uh, you know, the town's only about 600 people, and and the same five or six guys every morning came and had breakfast. And one of the guys only showed up so that he could make an, pick an argument and debate with everybody else at the table. And so that was the only reason he came was just to, just to kind of poke at people. And most everybody took it pretty fun. And, you know, while that can be fun and can be awful irritating, um, how many of you do that with God? Yeah, not funny anymore, is it? You know, the truth of the matter is, is we would say that we would never do this with God, but isn't it true that when we come up with our own plans, when we tell God what to do, when we've decided that we've got it better than Him, that this is exactly what we're doing with God? And today we're going to see an example of it, of somebody who knew better than God and, uh, and tries to share that opinion with God, with Jesus, and it doesn't work out too good for him. 
And so we're going to see that. So if you have your Bibles, would you open it up to Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 21? And we're going to see, hopefully, how we can honor the, law, uh, honor the Lord by building upon the truth of Jesus Christ and not upon our own opinions and ideals. Starting in verse 21, we read this. From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you that you love us. And we thank you, Father, even for examples like this, because there is much to learn here. And we pray, Father, today that you would just open our hearts and our minds and help us to see you, to follow you, to love you, and to truly make you Lord of our lives, the place where you deserve. We thank you and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the first point today is that the mission of the Messiah was sacrificial. Now, this little tiny passage, just these few verses here, probably brings up lots of different questions. Why does Jesus need to suffer? Why did Peter rebuke Jesus? Why did Jesus call Peter Satan? Those are all pretty fair questions, aren't they? Well, I'm hoping we're going to answer these questions as we look into it, as we go verse by verse and, and try to put this into a bigger context, a much bigger context. And so starting with verse 21, we see that Jesus points out to his disciples what he's about to do, what he's going to do. Now, until this point, it is true that Jesus has been alluding to the cross, has he not? Yes, he has. And so he has been kind of giving them hints, although a little bit veiled and clearly they haven't fully understood. He's been kind of telling them, you know, the day is coming. The day is coming. The day is coming. And I believe that, that Jesus has always understood with some clarity. Um, now, always is a, maybe not the right word, but he has understood his mission. But until the confession of Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God, um, Jesus had not clearly stated where he was headed, that he was going to the cross. And so I want you to see this because it's important for us to understand that this was the plan of Jesus all along. This is the plan of God being fulfilled in Jesus, that Jesus would head to the cross. He didn't make it up as he went. Jesus had been headed to the cross since the day that he was born. And while we don't know exactly when and how he understood everything, it is very clear that he understood it for a long time. Matthew 9, 15, Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them and they will, and then they will fast. There's a picture. Matthew 10, 38, and whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You know what? Who would have thought that that was both figurative and literal? Not until the, the death, burial, and resurrection would they have fully understood the, the consequences and the ramification and, and the scope of what it means to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Matthew twelve forty For as Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will enter the heart of the earth three days and three nights. You see, Jesus understood, and now he's pointing it out directly. Well, how did he know? We're not specifically told, perhaps through scripture, perhaps through prayer, maybe through direct revelation from the Holy Spirit. But no matter how Jesus knew and exactly when he knew, he knew. And he is now revealing it to the disciples. So back to our passage, he's revealing it and he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. Well, the disciples may not have understood, but even saying that he was going to Jerusalem is a big deal. They would understand it a little bit later when, when Jesus would say in Matthew 23, 37, that Jerusalem is, a, is the killer of prophets. So not only is Jesus going there, but he's going to suffer. He's going to be killed. He's going to be raised on the third day. You know what? Everything has changed. 
the symbology is gone, and Jesus is clearly pointing them to exactly what he is about to go through. And while I'm, I'm, I'm positive that they may not have fully understood it, this is the messianic ministry that Peter has just confessed. The Messiah was to establish a new covenant, like the one promised in Jeremiah 31. Because without the death of Jesus, there is no way in which we may be forgiven of our sins. This is a, a critical, a critical theology or doctrine of the church. Matthew 26, 28 says, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. If we want to be forgiven, we've got to have a sacrifice. And there was only one that was good enough, and that was Jesus. Jesus was an offering to God, of God, to God, a holy sacrifice, and in him we can be forgiven. From Genesis, in Genesis 3.15, when we see the promise of a child that will crush the head of Satan, all the way to Revelation, we see that not only was this planned, but it was necessary to free us from the consequences of our sins. Revelation 1, 5b in our, in our scripture reading today says this, To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. Jesus is the lamb that was slain. Praise the Lord, because without it, we could not be forgiven. But by his, by his death, by the shedding of his blood and through the power of his resurrection, forgiveness became obtainable and our salvation was purchased. So the second point today is that the mission of the Messiah was heaven ordained. And I changed this next point and just made it just one sub point. So for those of you that, that know that every point must have a second and every sub point must have another, uh, you're just going to have to forgive it today. Jesus is Lord, therefore he is in charge and we aren't. You know, as we start off here in this point, we need to see that Jesus is doing the will of the Father in verse 23, isn't he? He is thinking about God's concerns. And it's important that we understand this. The Father sent him because the Father loved us so much that he sent his Son. Isn't that what John 3.16 said? For God, the Father, so loved the world. The Father willed for Jesus to die so that we could save. The Father uh, loved us so much that he was willing to give us Jesus, and Jesus loved the Father so much and was so obedient that he was willing to die. Sometimes I hear people speak about this, and they make it all about them. And how many have ever heard kind of the, the line that says, you know, Jesus would have died for you even if you were the only one, and, and all of those kind of things. And I'm just not sure where we come from that, because first off, it's not in Scripture. But the second thing is, is it takes the focus from what is really significant, and it puts it on us. It, it isn't about you. Yes, Jesus did die in your place, but he did so at the will of the Father. When he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, we don't see Jesus saying, oh God, I love these people so much, let me die this horrible death apart from you. Instead, we see Jesus yielding to the Father saying, Father, if there's any other way, let it be done. But if not, thy will be done. That's what it is. And so I'm not saying that God doesn't love us. I'm not saying that it isn't a significant gift. It's absolutely significant, but it's, but it's not all about us. And so we, we see Jesus yielding to the Father. We see Jesus um, doing exactly what's right, having the hurt concerns of heaven and fulfilling the will of the Father. Make no mistake, God absolutely loves you. But it, but it isn't all about us. So back to the passage in verse 23, we see that Jesus has the concerns of heaven, which is what I was just describing. In verse 22, though, we see that Peter rebukes Jesus, doesn't he? Now, I read that a little harsh as I read the scripture reading this morning. But the fact of the matter is, it's, it's harsher, more harsh. Which one's right? more harsher. Oh, yeah. In fact, it's extreme the way it reads in, in Greek. 
It, it is really harsh. It's harsher. Yeah. Leave me alone. I'm good. <laughs> Don't confuse me. <laughs> I have to look to my wife uh, because she tells me after every sermon what I messed up. So I want to just go ahead and get it now as opposed to later. <laughs> and so... You know, the, the, it just got a lot hotter in here for you, apparently. <clears throat> this language is so strong. In fact, it almost has no equal in the New Testament. When Jesus is, when Jesus is being told by Peter, no way, it, it carries the force of something like, heaven forbid it. Absolutely not. There's no way that this can happen. And you can almost see Peter raising his voice as you read it. It is, it is an absolutely strong statement. It carries a, a, a great force. And he's saying, there's no way that you are going to die. There's no way that this can happen. Now let me ask you, does that seem appropriate to you? Does it seem appropriate for Matthew, or for Peter, who in Matthew five, seven verses earlier in 1616 said this. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And now as he calls him Lord, he would rebuke him and tell him that he's got it wrong. <laughs> I am so glad that you see the irony in that. You are the, the Messiah. You are the Lord. You are the son of the living God. Now, be quiet for a minute while I tell you what you need to do. You know, the truth is, is it's stronger than that. Uh, it, it just gets a little scary saying it. You know, there's lots of questions in the Bible, and we see a lot of approved questions, and, and times when God seems to tolerate questions with any issues at all. Like Mary, how can this be, Lord? How can this be? Or Job, when he questions why. Or Gideon, when he isn't sure and he sets out a fleece. Abraham and Sarah question their ability to have a child so late in life. But Peter doesn't question. Peter rebukes the Lord. And how do you call Jesus Lord and rebuke him in the next sentence? Literally, the next words that Peter say to Jesus. The next words that, that Peter says are a rebuke after making him Lord. You know, I'm quick to come to Peter's defense on so many different things. This surely isn't one of them. You see, Jesus is either Lord or he's not. You can only, you can only have one boss, one master, one Lord. Mike, would you reopen this door for us? And would somebody open the doors in the fellowship hall for us and we'll get a little breeze. Thank you. Little, uh, little cross, cross uh, draft there. It was appropriate for Peter to be shocked. It was appropriate for Peter to wonder how this could be. But it was not appropriate to tell Jesus no and to reject what he was saying. And in the response of Jesus, we see something very shocking. What does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. You know, it's, it's hard to say that with your smile on your face, isn't it? Trying to stop Jesus from fulfilling the goal, Peter is inadvertently doing the same thing that Satan did during the temptation of the Christ. Remember back to the start of the ministry, the public ministry of Jesus in Matthew chapter four, verses eight and nine. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Satan's offering him a shortcut, isn't he? He's offering him an alternative to the plan of God. One that would serve him instead of honor the Father. 
And I hate to say it, but I feel that sometimes people do the exact same thing with different words. We need to be extremely careful. God is the only one that gets to determine his perfect will for your life, for your relationships, and for your future. And when we reject his will, we reject <clears throat> his lordship. When we teach against his word, when we tell people that it's okay to sin, when we try to make the Bible say something that it doesn't in order to support our stance or our views, we are taking the position of God, the position of Lord. Perhaps we ought to respond to it as Peter did to Jesus, but instead to the false teaching. May it never be. Oh no, Lord. May it never be that the church would sell out the lordship of Jesus. May it never happen. May we always follow God and be his people. And then our third point today is that the mission of the Messiah was built upon the rock and not the block. And we'll explain that as we go on. The last point just wraps this up really nicely in verse 23. Jesus uses a word to describe Peter and the word is scandalon. Uh, it's the word that we get scandal from, although it doesn't mean scandal at all. The word scandal on means stumbling block. Uh, and a stumbling block is a significant concept. There are things that cause people to trip. There are things that cause people to stumble and die. That's what this is talking about. Literally, this is a baited trap designed to ensnare, ensnare prey. Another one says that it isn't a stone to get tossed. It is the stone that will set you up for moral failure and death. Peter, through his own arrogance, and nothing short of his arrogance would have led him to say this, has given Jesus another option and potentially set up a trap of, for all of mankind that would have kept us in sin. But you know what? Jesus is not building the church upon Peter, is he? He is building the church upon the rock. And we know the rock to be the confession of Peter and the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so Jesus builds upon the Petras, or the Petra, the, the, the rock that he has pronounced here just a couple of verses earlier, not the block, not the scandalon, the stumbling block that Peter and Satan would have had him to build upon. Jesus didn't come here to make himself happy. He came here to obey the will of the Father and to die for us while we were his enemies. God still desires to build upon the rock today. The rock, the truth of Jesus Christ. In fact, it is the only way that God will build his church. And so as a church, we need to make sure that we're building upon the rock and not the block. We need to teach the full counsel of God's word. We need to teach the horribleness of sin. We need to teach the sufficiency of Jesus and no one else for the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. And we must teach that Jesus is coming back and that we need to be ready. And so today, as we look at this, I just challenge you just very simply today. Will you commit with me to make sure that we lift the name of Jesus and build the church upon him as far as it depends upon us? Will you commit with me to pray and ask God to show us his way so that we would know and do his will? Will you commit with me to follow God's will no matter how different it is than the desires of the world or how personally costly it is to do the will of God instead of your will or the will of your friends? And if you will, then we do it in God's strength. We do it for the glory of the Lord. And we do it for the expansion of his kingdom. So may we commit our hearts to Jesus today. May we commit to follow the word of God, the will of God, the plan of God. May the message that we have be the message of God. And may we never sell out for something that makes us happy or, or makes us more appealing to the world, but leads people to moral failure that causes them to trip, to fall, and to die without Jesus. 
Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this wonderful day, and I thank you that you do love us. I thank you that your church is not built upon our faithfulness even, because we don't always get it right. And Peter is a good example of that, a man that truly loved you, but yet is a pretty good example of how that passion can be misdirected. So I pray today, Father, that you would help us, help us to love you, help us to follow you, help us to preach the whole word, to stand firm in holiness, to reject sin, all sin, and to be the pure and beautiful bride that you have called us to be. May we be for your honor, for your glory, and for your namesake. And I pray today, Father, that if there's one in here that has not given their life fully and completely to you, that they would, that today they would come to know the sufficiency of your death, burial, and resurrection so that they may be saved from their sins. I pray today, Father, that if there's one in here that, that has an area of their life that they have been withholding from you, that they have yielded to their own plan and, and, plan and have rejected yours, that today would be a day of sacrifice where we would cut it out, knock it off, forsake it for the sake of Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, please, to pick up our cross and follow you. In Jesus' name. And that's the call.